Yeah, hello everybody. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. For another session about uh, Leonardo, I'm, I'm Michael, the CTO of EnvyMed. And you already had a first introduction lesson with Dario uh, quite some weeks ago, where we learned about the really the fundamentals on how to use Leonardo to visualize your EnvyMed data. Now it's going to be a bit more, more deeper into some specialized aspects. And what we actually have are two um, specific things. So we're going to talk about um, 2D maps and as well as 3D maps. So for the 2D maps, we will talk about classifications. We will talk about these funny SLDX files you may have seen in your NVMED outputs and you ever wondered what are those. And um, we will talk about a new feature we have just introduced in our last um, version, 5.6. That's all the multi data maps. So that's for the 2D maps. And for the um, 3D maps, we will talk a bit about 3D data visualization. What are the, the different options we have? Um, how can we visualize wind fields? And last but not least, um, animations. So let's just um, dive into it. And I've prepared a little map in Leonardo. So it's from the Columbus Circle example we also have on our .info website. There it is stored for an um, example for dynamic thermal comfort. But you can also use it, of course, for, for, for other things. So it's a typical um, NVMED simulation where we, for example, simulate the hot summer day. And um, this is a classical distribution. In this case, we are having a map of the PET value, so the physical equivalent temperature, um, with the buildings around it um, and with the classical color scale ranging from the coolest spot, in this case, about 30 degrees centigrade up to 50 degrees centigrade. So that's basically um, what you get when you use the default settings in Leonardo and you extract um, data using the data manager or the data navigator from your simulation outputs. So you probably know all this has been done here in the data layer legend settings. So um, you can select the number of um, variables. So you could select a um, number of um, colors or a color scale, which you like, or which you think is most appropriate for your um, use case, number of colors. So in this case, um, 10 colors. And um, do you want a continuous color scale? So that means that the different colors are floating into each other, means they are interpolated. Or do you like to have, oh, sorry, that one here. Or you would like to have the um, not floating color points. So these are these scales where every color class has its own distinct color and there is no distinction. So I was just moving to the um, next section. This is what we're going to talk about in the first round. This is about the classification. So for the moment, we're just having the pure numbers here, 31, 50, or, or whatever you, you like. Um, but often you would like to um, group these information into classes. For example, especially for, for thermal comfort um, aspects, you want to have a class for cool, a class for cold, a class for hot, a class for this and that. And to group these, um, these data fields into these um, distinct classes. So for this case, um, we do have the other option, and this is what I was just moving into, where we have the, the option for a legend classification, which is continuous at the moment. So that means we have the color scale and we have a number scale, and we're just putting all the colors from the smallest value to the top value, giving a number of colors we have. So um, just start over with a simple example, and it's also an example. Um, for example, of how to use Data Studio. So just using Data Studio at the moment only for a very, very cheap um, thing. I just want to um, generate classes. So um, we will definitely make another session on Leonardo just dealing with the Data Studio, which enables you to um, use Python to control the Leonardo map, to control the data analysis. So for this example, I have a, a script which is shipped with MMN. It's called Classify Pet, and what it actually does is um, that it um, just gives me the option to um, define classes for PET classes of thermal comfort. 
And I just use this strip because I'm too lazy to do it by hand. But of course, you can also do this by hand. So let's start the script. And that's all I want to do in the moment. And then you see the changes in the colors, the changes in the legend. You see this um, legend has now switched from the color scale from the, it was before to a distinct color classes, to distinct information classes. Here in this case, we actually do have um, one, two, three, four, five classes, which we have defined and each class has its own name. For example, this is the class with the name comfortable. And this stands for PET values from 15 to 23 degrees centigrade. This is the color slide heat stress representing all grid points with a color uh, with a temperature between 23 and 29 degrees and so on and so on. And of course, we also need to have an empty class. So if there are some grid points which does not fall into any of these classes, this would be drawn in white in this case. So how do we use this? So I've just used the script to generate these um, classes, but you can also do this, of course, by hand. I just used the script to have something to start over. And if you go to um, the right, uh, left hand side of the map and you go to the settings of the data layer, so going to the map content and change um, or switch to data layer legend, if you're not already there, and then move down. And now you see the setting of Leonardo now has changed from continuous, which it was before. I just can switch it also back. So that's not a problem. You can switch between these on different um, ways of doing it to classify it. And now you have the different classes. In this case, these um, five classes I have defined plus this one extra class for everything that does not went into the other classes. Um, and you can, of course, also um, edit your own classes or you edit, can edit the classes or add another class or change the boundary values of the class by just clicking on edit classes and settings. And there you see the different classes that are defined. For example, the class comfortable, the class slight heat stress, moderate stress on strong heat stress. And you see below here, every class has a name. So it's a caption. Um, I can just say it's not, it should not be strong heat stress, it should be um, unpleasant heat stress, or this is just really a, a label you give it. And you just say um, from which value to which value should this class be defined. So which temperature values, which PET values should fall into that class. So in this case, in case we start with a 30, five degrees PET to uh, 41 degree, which is not included at the last value. So it actually goes from 35 to 39.99999. So 41 will be the first value not inside that class. Let's say apply and you can change these settings. So you can add another class, for example, um, if you want to have a new class or you can move classes up and down and just say, okay, and then you have the, um, the changed label here, unpleasant heat stress and the values accordingly. And for example, if you change your mind and say, okay, um, I'm not a friend of this classification. I think um, unpleasant heat stress should go not to 30, 41, but to, uh, I don't know, 45 degrees centigrade. Say, okay, okay, that it says, of course, um, this can't be the case here, yeah, I have to, change this class first because classes of course cannot overlap because otherwise it's not possible to make a classification so we move the extreme heat stress class so that it begins at 45 now and now i can say the class just decided will go to 45 and now we have changed classification so everything from 35 to 30, 45 now is unpleasant heat stress and everything beyond 45 to 70 will be extreme heat stress. You can just say, okay. And so not many things changed here because all stays in the same class, but so you can edit the classifications as you like it, as you need it, and whatever is your context of your analysis. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. 
So if you save this, um, everything will be in the map and it will be stored as you see it and it can be plotted. And the data, this is very important, is not changed in the map. So this classification is done on the fly. The map still holds the original data. So if you change the classification or you decide, oh, I don't want the classification style, you can anytime switch back to the continuous form and then have back the original data. So the original data set is not destroyed by, by doing that. Okay, so that's the first thing. So I will have three topics, as I said, for the 2D maps. And after these um, three topics, there will be, we make a question um, and answer section. So I'm just going on a bit ahead to the next topic. Um, and this is about these um, special layer information. So this SLDX file you might have seen somewhere. So um, I just open to the, um, go into the data navigator and then open a surface file. So I already did that, but I just did it once again. So again, this is the Columbus circle example. And for example, for the surface data in your output folder from NVMet, you know there are all these um, EDX files or these um, information files. And so if you just pick one and you open it and it's, you just can make a map out of it, for example, from for the um, surface temperature. So that's pretty straightforward. So just as shown in the, in the last um, tutorial for Leonardo, just say extract 2D. And then, for example, um, you can have um, a map of the surface temperature. But that's not what I'm going to show you. Uh, there is another thing which we can use. So if we go to um, Data Navigator and we look at the mapping, so which variable should be where, um, there is the option for the special layer. You know, this is the layer where all the information, where are the buildings, where are the trees, um, what is there. And you can also say, in this file, there is a special field, and this field is called soil profile type. So this is the ID of the soil profile. We have put it on the map. So we have put it in place in your model area. For example, when you work with spaces and introduce some kind of soil material, and it says grass, <clears throat> or is it not, not grass, I mean, loamy soil, um, water, pavement, asphalt road, and so on. So if we pick that one here, say we put onto the special layer, the soil profile type, and do extract the map. So first, we don't see anything, but what, but stay tuned. Something is going to be added. So then we go back to the map content, and then we have a look at the um, special layer settings. So I turn off the data layer because um, I don't need the data layer right now, so don't see much right now. When we go to the special layer legend. No, not special. Settings on it. So um, normally you press this button here, NVMet defaults, and these are your NVMet defaults. It says, oh, the buildings are drawn in black, so the vegetation is drawn in green. So that's pretty standard. But now for some things, like especially for the surface type, there is another file, this SLDX file. And once um, Leonardo detects that this file is there, I just move here, move me a bit away from here so that you can better see it. So there is the second button, which normally ha doesn't have a function, but it has a function when you, for example, go for this um, surface data and you press the button IBS surfaces. It loads all the definitions, all the IDs that are defined in the model area. You see anything that's from the in, that's inside the database for different soil types is now listed here in the special layer. And of course, you do see um, the correct color. So you have an idea where is which surface type located in the map. Where is the asphalt road? Where is the water? Where is the loamy soil? And so on. And you see, of course, this is a long, long list here of different materials. And it doesn't really fit in the legend, so it's looking pretty ugly, isn't it? But of course, not all the materials are used in the map. 
So it would make sense just to include those materials, only those soil profile types in the map, which are actually used in the map. So that's pretty easy. There is a function. You can just go here and there's the more button, which acts, gives you some more um, options. And the option we are going to use right now is very simple. It just says hide unused items. So it just goes to maps, goes through the maps, it looks for every grid point, which kind of soil profile is used here. And is it used in the map? No, in this case, I'm not going to display it in the legend. Is it used in the map? Yes, I'm going to display it in the legend. So a lot of work if done by hand, but for the computer is really nothing. So just click on that. Wait a minute, and you see now all those surfaces which are actually not in the map are remo being removed from the legend. Of course, you can still and change that. So if you do have a, a different map um, and, you, and you want to have the shining granite in your legend, so that not every map maybe has a different legend. So you can, of course, um, select it or unselect it. And you can also select the groups. So in this case, all the different materials are just in one row. But you can also see the original groups in the database. So these are the groups, natural surfaces, for example. If you want to have the group titles shown, you can just also click on the group title here. Or legacy surfaces. It's not a nice title. You can also um, change the settings and you can edit them. So there is really a lot of things you can do with it um, to change the map so that it really fits your, your needs. So just remember there are just two simple things you need to do is just to go um, to a surface layer file, so to the surface folder from your output files and put in soil profile type onto the special layer. So this is not done automatically. You have to do this by hand, put it on the special layer, extract the whole stuff. And then once press these IBS surface buttons. So once it finds this SLDX files, which stands for special layer definition files, it's in the output folder. It's automatically generated when you run your simulation. Just press the button and you will have, will have um, all this special layer information linked in your map. Okay, fine. So third topic for the 2D maps. And this is a new feature, um, which was really re requested by many users um, because we had some similar thing um, in the earlier versions and some days it was dropped for, for different reasons, but now it's back. And this is the, the, the option to loop over different time steps of the day. So if you want to see, for example, the evolution of surface temperature, the evolution of air temperature, of humidity, or what doesn't really matter, you can use any variable that is available in Envimet to generate these settings. The only um, condition is that it has a time frame, so that there is a sequence starting, say, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You do not need to have every hour, but there has to be at least I mean, three or four different time steps in a row so that it makes sense to, to generate an animation out of that. So for example, if we go to, to the surface folder, or folder um, you see these are the, the typical um, visualization of this case. So for example, here we have a simulation that starts at 6 in the morning on the 21st of July, and it runs until 6 or 6 in the morning on the 23rd um, of July. So it's running over 48 hours. So it's a long simulation. So I can just pick um, some steps I just make remove this special data layer for the moment because this will kill my, my visualization. So just go back to NVMAT defaults and going back to switch the data layer on as well. So for example, if you want to have the um, surface temperature at 14 o'clock, just select 14 o'clock, select the correct variable, for example, surface temperature, Going to move in a bit. They will have the surface temperature at 14 o'clock. So this is nothing special. Um, this is what has just been shown in the, in the first um, example for Leonardo. So what we can do is we go can go to these um, data file map and we can say I just 
want to maybe see the evolution of surface temperature between eight o'clock on the first day and say 16 o'clock on the first day. So this range. So if you press the right mouse button on the first time you want to look at eight o'clock, say right mouse and say, set the time series. So this is going on to be, we're going to build a time series. Set this time series to start here at eight. So you see this little arrow. So it shows you all oh, your time series starts at eight in the morning at this day. And of course, you also have to say where you should end. So we want to end at 16 o'clock in the afternoon. Again, right mouse button. And logically, uh, we use the, the last option, set time series end to this time. So then we have to find a time series and it's visually shown with the arrow. And also it is on visualize with a red P from eight o'clock to 16 o'clock. So now we can go again to extract data to map. So this is uh, as you know it, but there is a new option available now. As soon as we have defined such a time series, we have a new button, which is called it extract 2D time series. So we just move it a bit so that we can see more. It's a very little screen. So that's much nicer. So I just press the button. And what it now does is to pick all these files, it's starting at eight o'clock, open the eight o'clock file, loading the data, displaying on the map, getting to the nine, nine o'clock step, loading the data, display it. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and so on, and so on. So this is all done completely automatically until it ends. So in my case, um, the end, it's about a very small time series. It ends at 16 o'clock. You can make it as long as you want. So that means you can make it as long as you do have data, obviously. So, okay, but where is it gone? Where's the data gone? So no. when I close the, the data manager, you see there is this little symbol here. This is for multi-data layer maps. And this is, let's see, okay, we have multi layers of information now in this map. We have started at eight o'clock and moved to 16 o'clock, but not these data have been loaded, but not forgotten. So they are still stored. And so if you go, for example, here into the recent map, there is a list of all these time slices I have extracted, eight o'clock to 16 o'clock. And so, for example, if I want to look at the surface temperature at 12, I select 12 o'clock and press the symbol here. And then the 12 o'clock layer is loaded. A bit. Or I can go to 15 o'clock, press the button. The 15 o'clock data layer is loaded. So it does not need to go back to the, your original data. It does not need to extract the data from the disk again. It's all stored in the map. As you save the map, all these multi layers are stored in the map. If you have 48 hours, the sequence of 48 hours of surface temperatures, all these 48 hours of surface temperature are stored in this two dimensional map. It's not working for 3D maps, it's working with 2D maps. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is you can also run an animation through these um, different layers. So you can go again into this menu here and you say um, animate to screen. And what it does, it starts at eight o'clock and then it runs until the last time steps and works, it does an interpolation between the different time steps. So it now works, works to uh, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And also there is a setting where you can say how many intermediate steps should have been done um, using um, interpolation techniques. So then it runs and runs and runs and it goes ahead until it has um, reached the, the final step. And there's also while he's working, there's also the option to um, store this directly into a video file. So of course this takes time. It's not a, not a big file, but if it's a bigger file or longer sequence, of course it can really take a while. You can also generate a video out of it. So it's only calculated once, and then you have an AV file or an MPEG file. There are different formats actually available. It works with FFmpeg, which is a very universal video driver. And then you do have this animation in a resolution you selected, in a format you selected, and you can play it back in PowerPoint or, or wherever you like. 
Yeah, of course. So while it is still running in the background, so this has been the um, the 2D map specials, so um, classifications. Um, what is this SRDX file for, and how can I display surface um, properties in a map? And secondly, these are the multi-data maps. Um, they work with data layer. They work as well also with the vector layer. So if you do have changing wind directions, for example, you can also animate those in the map. OK, so um, as, as promised, um, I will make a, a short break after we run through the 2D features before we move to the um, 3D features. And so now, if you do have some, some questions on that, um, please feel free to post that into the commentary. Um, yeah, just uh, from Nesem, um he said, how do I, do you define the scale of thermal comfort in a tropical zone? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not really directly related to Leonardo because we assume that we do have a classification, um, but um, thermal classification is always very subjective. It's a matter of season. It's a matter of um, cultural background. And it's also um, a matter of uh, adaption. So if you live in the tropics every day, um, of course, you do have a very different sense of um, what is heat stress and what is cold stress. Um, so I have to return this question because I simply cannot answer it because it really depends on what thermal comfort is for you. And for your region, you probably do have some literature what is a typical scale for the tropics? So which PET value or which UTCI value would be considered as hot in the tropics? And so once you have found that, that's beyond Envimed, it's beyond Leonardo, you can just, of course, enter the classes into this classification scheme. So if hot in the tropic means between 40 and 50 degrees, you can define the boundaries of this hot class to be between 40 and and 50, of course, so that's not really a problem. OK, so I think this one has finished. So I'm just checking if there are um, different questions. Not so far, so I'm just I'm cleaning up my, my, my screen a bit here so that we can go ahead to um, th think about the, the, two, uh, the 3D maps. Okay, for the for the three D maps, actually, uh, I will move to a, a smaller project because three D is more time consuming and um, it has a long loading time. So you can see all the the techniques behind it. It also works for large scale models as well as for small scale models. So um, the model I'm going to use is the model urban layout. If you have been visiting our I'm just going to remove that banner here. So I remove that banner here. So um, if you go to our .info website, you know there is a number of uh, pre-calculated um, model files. So you don't need to run element on your own. And this urban layout example is one of this. And I'm just going to, to just open them. So I've copied that to my, my disk. And this is the urban layout. And if you see, if you hear some funny noises in the background, that's our dock actually. It's very noisy. So I'm going to the atmosphere folder. You just pick a, a file. Just you have a look at the how the model looks like. It's sometimes easier to understand in 2D. Just for example, keep the the air temperature as a variable. So air temperature and just um, extract it on one level that doesn't, doesn't really matter at what level because we are going to work with um, 3D maps not with 2D maps so this is just to show you um, how the model does look like so it's a very, very simple model with some some buildings um, all over the place and there are some there's also some vegetation okay and to make the vegetation visible maybe as well That was the wrong point. Yeah, that's where on this level there's no vegetation, so maybe I go up a little higher to catch some trees. 
Yeah, okay, so now it's better. So this is something, this is not a problem in 3 because we will see all, all of the model area immediately in 3D. So this is a classical 2D map. And once we want to go to 3D, of course, it's the same concept. Um, if you do have um, a file, of course, which is in 3D, this is um, the only um, necessary condition you have to meet. So the atmosphere files are always in 3D because they capture the complete atmosphere model. Um, so let's make it bigger now as we go to move. So we're going to um, extract um, set to 2D maps. So we have worked with that so far. So we make this small and open the other one. So extract set to 3D map. And now, of course, as we are in 3D, we do not have to make any um, decisions on where to cut the 3D data to a 2D map because we can get all the 3D data in one go. And I do not do, don't do anything special. I just press the button, extract 3D, and it just now gets the complete model area. It gets the complete um, data. It gets everything that's inside. So you have seen this way of looking at it in the last and uh, the very first introduction into Leonardo. Um, Dario did not mention this view control here because um, you can, of course, move with the mouse, you press the, the string, the control button or str string button, depending on your keyboard language, and move the mouse around while holding the button, or press down the shift button and move the mouse around to make um, the model of um, shift and control to rotate it. But you can also use these buttons because sometimes it's more easier to understand. You go move forward, you move backward, or you change the height of your person and move forward. Because sometimes you want to be at a specific location in your street, in the street canyon, look at the building, look at the facade. And there's a combination between um, using the shift button to navigate to the correct position and use the control button to get um, to here. And then it would be really difficult to navigate with the mouse. So then in the, it's, it's put the time for this view control, which makes it really easy to um, navigate through there. And you can also, um, if you go on the 3D tab, you can change between third person view or third, third person control, which is the default, or a first person, which changes the, the way we interpret um, the things. So first person, so it's just like in a shooter game, um, where you basically behave like a, a person looking upward, downward, left, right, and third person is the camera perspective of a movie um, actor or a movie um, that is um, filmed. Okay, so just move that by side. Going back again so that we can see. So now if I want to display data, I go to map control. I do have the 3D data layer now obviously available and it's hidden because this is the default setting because this can take quite a long time if it's a large model and you immediately start to visualize the data layer, it will be not too fancy. So I think I will turn this on by pressing the right mouse button and here we go. Just move that a bit. I can keep that one. So now we see, we go move to backward. We see the complete three dimensional information of the model area. So we're actually looking at the complete model cube with all grid points colored in their temperature. So while this looks somehow nice, it doesn't transport any information, unfortunately. So um, what we need to do is we have to find a way to, to cut that. So we, there are several options on how to um, transform this uh, information into something um, that is actually understandable by the user. So the first way what we can do is we go to data layer settings. And there are these two options. The first option is to filter data by value. So what we actually need to do is we need to remove grid points. We cannot draw all the grid points because if we draw all the grid points, we don't see anything. So we have to make a selection which grid points shall we draw and which grid points shall not be drawn. 
One option, we can combine both options, is to filter by value. So we can have press the button full range. So in this case, on the model checks, which is what is the lowest temperature in my 3D data cube and what is the highest temperature in my 3D data cube. So in this case, my range is from 28.84 to um, 33.67. So that's the full range. So if we keep that, everything will be drawn. So there is no change. So what if we change this, that we only draw grid points between 30 degrees and the maximum. Let's try that. Then you see all the other grid points which are below 30 degrees are not drawn, which of course reduces my drawing area to the closer to the surface areas because this is of course the situation where most of the um, warmer air is situated. So that's one thing. This probably maybe work with wind speed better than with air temperature to illustrate zones of low wind speed or to show zones of higher wind speed. So that's option number one. So if I turn off option number one, go back and we again have the same cube. The other option is to, to cut the cube by location. And this is, this is the second option here, filter by location. So by default, everything is drawn from everything from everywhere to everywhere. So the, my model has 100 grid points in the X direction. It has 100 grid points in the Y direction and it has 24 grid points in the Z direction. So for example, we can set this to 50. Say so then it is drawn from zero to 50. I'll say update. So you see now it's cut it here. So the grid points from zero to 50. So zero is in this um, case here, zero to 50 are drawn. And from 50 to 100, they are not drawn. I can do the same thing on the X on the Y axis, also from zero to 50. And then the cube is cut it in this time. And as you guess it, I can also do the same with the Z direction, say from zero to 10. So you can make this cube smaller. And if you want to have the complete Y slice, for example, again, you can just press this button here that then it is returning to the complete slice. Or uh, Another option is you have, can make a very, very thin slice, for example, just one grid point, say from zero to one. We also use the complete y x. So we have complete x direction and we have just one grid point white in the y direction. And using this button here, you can move this um, position to the left or to the right. So just press that one. You see how it is moving through the model area, keeping the dimension, but changing the grid point. Okay. And another thing which you can also do is to work with transparency. I'm just moving to my. face to the other side, work with transparency, which is say, say 71. Well, that's, that's very much, there's a lot of transparency. And you can make the data layer a bit transparent. And of course you can also make the slice a bit bigger than again. Or you can also reduce the cube size. In this case, um, the cube is not drawing in its full extension, but it's drawing a bit smaller so that you can have this little impression. So in the end, which combination you use? So filtering by value, um, cutting the location, using transparency, um, making the data cube smaller or using the full size. That depends. You can also make it completely flat. That doesn't look too good or draw the, the borders of the grid points. So um, 
that really depends. So there is no, no general best way of doing it. Depends on the model area, depends on what you are going to, to show. Um, so what is your intention? So you can make very beautiful um, maps out of it. But remember, in most cases, uh, you do produce maps with the intention that people understand what you're going to um, inform them about. So it doesn't make sense if it looks nice, but it doesn't transport any information about the microclimate in your model area. You just do it for artistic um, reasons. Of course, it's also nice if you do it as a plot to put it on your wall. But for scientific maps, normally um, the choice is not the best looking option, but it's the option who transports most of the information in a comprehensive way. Okay, let's go to, to Windfield. Um, there is only one option to um, visualize the Windfield in NVMet, uh, in Leonardo NVMet at the moment. So I'm turning off the, the data layer. And this is, are the wind tubes. So I'm going to make it a bit smaller or tubular bells. Um, if you go to um, vector layers 3D, and the, you see the option um, tubular bells settings. So what are tubular bells? I have a Mike Ophit album called Tubular Bells, but I haven't seen that in, my, uh, in the United so far. Um, very simple. Um, we just go, we select them and, and turn it on. So you have a first impression of what it is. Yes, it's streamlines, it's 3D streamlines. Um, so if you turn that on, and you of course have a number of, of settings. So for example, you can use a fixed color for the tubes. So now they are colored with a data layer color, but we can also use a, a fixed um, a fixed color. So I just go to remove the floor in the 3D setting because it's a bit disturbing. So just go to three general settings. Oh. 3D settings, so remove the floor. Otherwise it's going to be a bit messy, especially when we have um, it compressed on the video platform. Okay, so. So I'm going to change the height a bit so that we actually see. So the tubular bells actually are very good in showing how um, flow um, is um, interacting with the in buildings, especially um, or with vegetation also. Um, so you see how it is um, being, the direction is being changed and how the flow is moved upward or downward. And there are also a number of options you, you can set here. So we go back to the tubular bell settings. So example, how the, the tube diameter, you can have thicker tubes depending on the, um, the size of your model. If you want to have thicker tubes or thinner tubes, that depends on what is actually um, required. You can also change the number of tubes. It's 400 tubes here. You can also go to up to 800, but don't exaggerate that. We need to re rebuild tube geometry. It gets you a new set of tubes. In this case, um, 800 tubes. You see it's a, quite a num num more more tubes available right now, and you see much more funny effects. You can also change the the starting point of the tube. So in this case, the tubes are starting everywhere in the model, but you can also say they're starting at the left side of the model. So, so the, the principle, of course, did not change, um, but the, the distribution is a bit different, so we can go a bit higher. So it's the same, uh, what, what has been said for the, um, the 3D data layer is the same here. So um, you have to play around with it. So uh, this, it really depends on your model geometry and it also depending on, on what do you want to show to the, to the people. So for example, do you want the people to show um, how uh, the flow is interacting with the, with the building or so, how, it's lift, how the flow feed is lifted up when it is confronted with the building? You, of course, have to make your experiments. How many tubes do I need? Is it a smaller tube, a larger tube? Um, shall I use the, the data layer color for the tube? So it works like in the um, like for the vector layer. And what is the best perspective? Where should I place the camera? From where should the tubes come? So there is no general um, solution on, on that. OK, but it's, very no it's a very nice effect. And that brings me to our last 
on thing, the animations. So we have seen a lot of perspectives already here. So a lot of um, camera settings, um, height settings, and so on. Um, you can store those. If you go to um, the 3D map, there is an option that is called Maps and Scenes. And this opens, opens a little um, new control here. So we can also um, click that. Um, I will make this smaller so that I have some space left. Yeah, so you do the, um, for example, you do have a nice um, position of um, your model view. So maybe you start with an overview. I think, oh, yes, that's a good view on my 3D model. I like this view. I like to store this view. Then you just um, put it on and Okay, makes it new, makes this makes it a new position. So you have to move it a bit and say add scene, and then it stores the settings, your recent position as a frame, as a setting at position zero point. So it's like a movie. You start with the very beginning, uh, with your first setting of the camera, and then you move to the next setting. For example, you want to move forward into your model area. So that's enough. Don't do too many steps. You do the same thing at scene. Then you have another setting added. So then you want to go deeper into your model area, for example. Stop. Again, at scene. You go a bit forward. At scene. Go even deeper. Well, now I'm in a building that happens from time to time. I want to look upward a bit, so I'm not looking at the floor, so I want to look at the, at the sky a bit, so that's nice. Add scene. So the first thing is you can use these maps and scene window as just a compilation of different um, views on your model area. So this is also stored with your file. So once you save this file as a Leonardo map, um, all the data is saved, all the graphical setting is saved, and also these maps and scene settings are saved. So you can just click on the maps and scene and it navigates to exactly the camera position you have stored. And also, as we talked about animations, if you go to this point, it starts from the very beginning and it does an animation um, from your first position, looping over to the next position, to the next position, and generating a smooth transition. Um, yeah, what we would say an animation. You can also interrupt it, or if you say, I just want to have this position here, you can also say, start the animation from this frame, from frame at 10 seconds to the frame 15 seconds. And then it just starts at this position. <clears throat> and it just um, yeah, follows your, your tracks. And of course, um, as this is also time consuming, you can make a video out of it. So just do this as, as an example. Um, so, to, to, to check so you can save this animation. Let's move it a bit. Replace scene, store scene, control window. So I just I'm looking at the, the button for the, the window animation. Yeah, so um, you can do this on the sequence here. And you can also, and this is something um, many people don't know, um, these are um, pretty complex images. So uh, a high-res resolution image, except for example, for these from these settings, so many people just make a, a screen hard copy out of it. That's not the best solution. Um, you can also use the button export high-res image out of that. So in this case, you have the option to um, 
Unfortunately, my, my screen is too small for that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a video production issue actually, because um, the recording screen is too small. So you can export that as an as an high res image. So it will be um, producing on the um, the three D rendering tile by tile, and writes on a very high resolution, so many thousand pixels onto your disk. So for example, here is a BMP file, and then you can use it in a in a graphic program, for example, to um, export to Photoshop and, and to put it into high res um, um, resolution images or presentations. So I will start the, the animation. So while the, the animation is running, I can turn over. I go over to the um, the question and and answer section because we're almost at the the end of our um, live session. So I'm just going to read the comments over here. Okay, so this, I don't know if this um, has something to do with free. You know, head on talking about Brazil and I'm under environment working on analyzing some areas of the city. Do you consider it positive to use the LCS and student oak classification to analyze some avenues and squares? <coughs> um, not really, not really, because the um, local climate zone from, from Stuart and Oak, that's not a micro scale classification. It's a typical, it's a, um, a typical um, distribution of um, an area into tiles, which have a, a certain um, has certain properties and concerning of um, certain um, vegetation content, um, types of building, a number of buildings, um, and so on and so on. So it, it's okay if you do want to look at the city at all, so in its clusters, so have seen the differences between the high dense, high rise areas, park areas, the industrial areas, and so on and so on. So if it does not really matter if your avenue is orientated to the north or the south or the west or the east or, 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 or something different. So this, with this case, the classification zones do work because they do not have an orientation or so. There is no difference in an avenue which runs from the north to the south or an avenue which runs through the west to the east, which is okay because if you look at the city at all in a high resolution of say 50 by 50 meters, a lot of the differences render off. But here in, in Envimet, we're actually not looking at um, general patterns. We're looking at the exact patterns. So well, how is the avenue situated? And so it does not really make a lot of sense to use this classification scheme um, using small scale simulations with Envimet. So it does make maybe sense if you do use Envimet to make a, uh, to make a very coarse simulation to get some climate background information you say, okay, I run a model with a resolution of 30 by 30 meters, which is of course possible in Envimet. But in this case, um, you do not use the real building footprints, but in this case, you can use the um, local climate zone classification instead. And then you get a pattern of the distribution of wind and temperature and humidity and so on. And then I would like to go to go into detail in a certain corner of the city, in a certain park area, a certain avenue or so. And then, of course, you will go back to the real footprints, to the real vegetation, and leave the, the classification behind. But using the generated data from the local climate zone as a, as a background information, so kind of an urbanization of, of weather data. So this would make sense, yes. OK, thank you for the question. Yeah, so while looking if there are some some more questions, so the the animation is finished. It's uh, stopped at the the very uh, final step. So you can also um, delete scenes. You can also move scenes upward and downward, and this um, animation works with um, all. Um, Things. So you can also change the, the settings of the data layer within. So if you go to, um, say, this, this scene here, now my screen is really, really too small for this kind of operation. So I just turn everything, I have to so turn on the data layer. I have to check the data layer settings, of course. So 
So I've selected that one. So let's have a look here, transparency, whole section. It's turned on. So make this window smaller. So I'm just shifting around windows because if, but if you work with you now, you probably do have a large, much larger screen and so they do not need to have this shuffling around like I do in the moment. So I'll turn on this transparency again. So there is my, my cut window. And you see also the, the cut, the, the settings I had done with the data layer also move. And if I do have some changes here, maybe for example, the complete Z axis, we're already in the complete Z axis, um, using the complete Y axis as well. Of course, this is very um, computer, computationally heavy. Okay, so there's another question from Argentina. So then have a look at it. Okay, I was just saying thank you. So th thank you as well for, for, for watching us. So yeah, um, yes, hopefully, yes, it's very robust and um, it really helps to do many of the things that you have to do in your, your daily life. Of course, you can also export things to ArcGIS or to QGIS. And we're also working on a, on a Blender plugin right now so that you can also export your files to to Blender, which of course offers you a lot of more things you can do with um, rendering qualities and um, photorealistic rendering, walking through the area and so on. But in, for example, if you once have worked with a renderer uh, with Blender, you know how heavy the learning, how steep the learning curve is for, for Blender. And so this was the intention for Leonardo, not to put everything in it, but to put those things in it, you really require to do that on 2D and 3D levels and make it easily accessible for, for you. Yeah, so another from, from Brothers. So thank you, South America, for all your sharing. Thanks for the constant advance. Yes, and probably so. We are just um, having so much in, in mind to, to come up together with Helge and, and Tim, and there will be probably a lot of um, advancements, especially also for the, for the plugins and also for, for Leonardo. So, um, stay tuned for, um, for that. The Blender will be a game changer. Yes, hopefully. So uh, I have to be, be honest. So I'm not really able to use it. So <laughs> we already do have a beta version of it. So I think you can all, you can already download it. I'm not, not quite sure about that, but oh, it's really heavy. So it's heavy as he Blender is heavy and it adds some more stuff on it. So there will be a lot of things to do for us to make it accessible to, to the people. But I, I'm pretty sure, especially when it comes to the dynamic comfort, you know, where people are moving through the city and where it goes to the impression of a city for, seen from the eyes of a walking person, there are heaps of possibilities in Blender because there you can really put in the walking person, you can have the perspective on, on the model. Yeah, Camilla says, thank you very much. Thank you, Camilla, for, for watching. Uh, when should we expect? The, I have no idea. So really, this is done on a completely voluntary basis. Um, I'm actually not really quite sure if it's not really already available, just a bit hidden. Um, but I think yeah, we will we, we think over over summer we will make a package out of it. It doesn't really matter if it's really finished. It's open source because it's um, it's a Blender plugin. Everything is open source there. And uh, we just put it onto the Blender repository. Uh, maybe some more voluntary people are going to, to work with it. And especially for me, um, I have to do to watch some YouTube videos on how to use Blender because it's uh, I'm doing a mess with it at the moment. So, so one more question left. So I think there's also the, the final question because we're at the end. Thank you regarding the fluid model. Yeah. You, are you considering the no, because um, we do not look at the city at, um, at a complete organism. So that's a mesoscale approach for a city. So we're just looking at a single building, and a single building isn't porous. A single building is a solid shelter, 
And this is how we apply the Navier-Stokes equations to that. So we're using porosity for the vegetation, of course, where we use the drag forces enforced by the um, leaf area, but not for the building. So you, what you are mentioned, these equations, these are really for macro scale or mesoscale models where you do not model the building footprint um, in detail. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, we, there will be much more sessions to come, so just stay tuned, especially so for, <clears throat> for Leonardo. Um, there will be definitely a session about the data studio and the integration of charts and SVGs and so on. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching and have a nice day, evening, night, or whatever is ahead of you. So thank you.